Hello and welcome to the AutoX show. Now sit tight and don't go anywhere because on the show today we tell you which small automatic hatchback is worth your hard-earned cash. We talk to some of the owners of the beautiful historic machines at the Cartier Concours. And we test an SUV that thinks it's a coupe. But first, here's the brand new Maruti Suzuki Wagon R AMT versus the Hyundai Santro and Tata Tiago AMTs. If you're a car maker in India and you aren't operating in the B segment, make no mistake that you're missing out on a whole lot of action on the sales charts. For these cars, they sell well over 10,000 units a month at times. The Tiago has been around for a while now and it's been selling about 4 to 5,000 units a month, which is a fairly decent figure. And that's no surprise because the Tiago felt like the most mature and the most sophisticated offering in the B segment hatchback space. But the leading car makers in India, Maruti and Hyundai, weren't going to just sit and watch and let the Tiago soar past. So these two car makers have come out with the latest offerings for the B segment. And that comes in the form of the Santro and the latest being the new Wagon R. Now the Wagon R has evolved significantly over the previous model. Based on the fifth generation hard tech platform, this car is now longer and wider than earlier, so you get a lot more cabin space. Now this 1.2 litre four-cylinder engine has been borrowed straight out of cars such as the Swift, so this car now comes with a lot more firepower than ever before. As for Hyundai Santo, well that comes with a 1.1 litre four-cylinder petrol engine. And the Tiago of course has a 1.2 litre three-cylinder petrol engine. But the cars we have here, each of these are AMT gearbox equipped cars. So these are all the automatic models in their portfolio. So we're going to take a look at which of these cars now feels like the most premium and the most mature in terms of drive quality, ride comfort, in-cabin space, equipment and so on. Now when it comes to the Wagoner, you can't get more bang for your buck. For this 1.2 litre four-cylinder engine, easily is the best unit in this segment. The engine is not just more powerful than the other cars, but in terms of real-world drivability, there's excellent power from low down the rev range. And because it's a four-cylinder unit, vibrations are less as well. And in general, this engine combined with the gearbox makes this the most refined car amongst the three here. Now this AMT gearbox we've seen in earlier Maruti AMT cars as well, as is the case with Evolution. With every subsequent upgrade or in a new model, Maruti continues to make this system just a little bit better. So in this car now, it feels a little bit smoother than earlier. And then there's the other matter of power delivery. Now in the Santro, the system is just as smooth near about, but when a gear kicks in, there is a little bit of lag in that car, whereas there is no lag. As soon as you engage a gear in this, power kicks in directly at that point and you can accelerate hard right from that moment. On the handling front, while uh, the car is well balanced, there is a fair amount of body roll. But the real icing on the cake with the new Wagoner is its new suspension setup. It is fantastic. The way it dismisses road undulations and even sharp and large potholes is something that has to be admired. So the Wagoner, of course, is the newest car here. And uh, it definitely feels it. The interiors, the dashboard and everything. Uh, it looks quite lively because there's a lot of different colors and textures happening here. So that's very nice. It's a very inviting cabin. Of course, the highlight here is this new Smart Place Studio infotainment system. Now, as is visible, you can see that there's an insane amount of headroom. Now, it may look ridiculous, but they're taller people and uh, even with a hat on, you can sit in this car. While the seat position itself is correct, I would have definitely liked more supportive seat cushioning and an adjustable headrest because there's no support while you're driving along. Now, unlike the other two cars here, 
The Sandro is powered by a 1.1 liter engine instead of a 1.2 liter engine. But don't be fooled by those figures, simply because the Diagos is a three cylinder engine and the Santos is a four cylinder unit. In fact, this 1.1 liter four cylinder engine was used in the very first Santro, if you remember correctly. But for this car, Hyundai has heavily reworked the unit, so it's a lot more refined now. It's very smooth, it's very quiet, and fuel efficiency has been improved as well. Now, this engine could have done with a little more zest in the lower end of the power band, but it's the mid range that is the meat of this engine's power band. That's where all of the power is available, and it performs very well in that range. As for this AMT gearbox, well, this is the only unit in the industry that uses an electronic actuator instead of a hydraulic one. As a result, shifts are definitely quieter and smoother when you're driving normally in the city. So driving faster will reveal that this AMT has the typical head nod nature which is associated with all the other cars for when you're going flat out. So the gearbox will pause while giving you the next gear while driving fast and there's nothing you can do about that movement that comes along. What again I have noticed with the system is that unlike in the Wagon R, where the moment the gearbox downshifts you get instant power out on the road, for once a gear is engaged it takes a while for the engine's power to kick in. But once it does, that mid-range is going to impress you. And the suspension setup, while it's comfortable on its own, the Wagon R suspension is now so good when it comes to ride comfort that this car is lagging a little bit behind that in terms of overall ride comfort. Now moving on to the interiors of the Santro, I would have to say that this feels like the most premium cabin out of the three of these cars. Now the overall layout is quite well designed, plenty of different design elements going on everywhere. The switchgear quality is very good, it's the best amongst all these cars here. I like the layout of the dashboard. The touchscreen system is very nice, although there's a bit of delay when you're operating the system. Another aspect that I do not like are the speakers that are hooked up to the system because the sound quality could have definitely been better from them. Moving on to the seats, I would have to say that the Santo seats are better than the Wagnars. They feel more supportive, they're better designed as well. Now, like the Wagoner, the Tiago comes with a 1.2 liter engine, but this is a three cylinder unit. As a result, uh, there's some of that three cylinder thrumminess, and there's a lot of vibrations from this three cylinder unit. That's a realistic problem that you have to live with every day. This gearbox, again, does not feel as good as the Wagoner's or the Santro's five speed AMT, simply because there's just quite a lot of lag when it comes to downshifts or upshifts and sometimes it's just left deciding whether to give you the next gear or whether to go down a gear or not. So you really have to mash the pedal a little bit to ensure that the system gets what you're trying to communicate. But then again you have to remember that this is the oldest car amongst the three of them here. So this AMT system in all cars whether it be a Maruti or a Hyundai or a Tata, uh, it has always improved constantly over time with every new model. So I'm sure that once Tata comes out with a newer model, it'll be better. And in fact, some passionate Tiago customers have written in to us also in comments and feedback saying that do drive the updated Tiago for that one drives a lot smoother than the original model that came out. Now the Tiago suspension setup again is something that goes very well with the upmarket nature of this car. It dismisses road undulations and potholes with a certain kind of panache which was not present in B-segment cars before this. Coming to the engine, because of the nature that the gearbox has been synced in, it's only when you mash the pedal and the rev counter needle jumps to 3000 RPM that the Tiago starts going ahead. So this is not the best transmission with which you should judge this engine's performance. For otherwise, uh, this car cruises at triple digit speeds fairly comfortably and the Tiago has a very well balanced chassis. So the Tiago on its own is not a bad car to drive. It's just that this AMT gearbox definitely could have been better. Now over large ruts and potholes, 
the Tiago retains its composure at higher speeds as well and this is the only car to come with alloy wheels in this segment so you are not too worried about bending a rim over large potholes or any of that. Coming to the interiors of the Tiago, Tata had done a great job of designing the interiors of this car. For even a couple of years after the launch of this car, the design still does not look dated. There's nice textures and plastic quality going on over here. You get body colored inserts around the air vents on the sides. Now coming back to the stereo, this unit is mated to the best speakers in this segment so you have very good sound quality and uh, otherwise in terms of equipment you get everything that you need. Now this is the only car in the segment to come with a height adjustable driver's seat. I really like that so that's another plus point for the Tiago. What I do not like though is that uh, there's a fair amount of NVH from this engine so even at idle or while going along. The rear view mirror tends to shake, that's not a good thing, it's not a stable sight uh, for you. So a couple of these things Tata could have fine tuned. Now this car has only run 13,000 kilometers and yet the adjusters for the side air vents have come off. So build quality definitely could have been better when it comes to certain aspects but aside from that plastic quality and switchgear quality everything is very decent in here. Coming to the seats, they've been very well designed. They look and feel like they are the best in the segment and uh, they offer fairly decent support as well and you get adjustable headrests at the front. So that is again another plus point for the Tiago. So far as the cabin is concerned, the Tiago definitely seems to be leading this page. So the newest entrant in this segment, the Wagonart, truly has taken the game forward for B-segment hatchbacks. This car now comes with the most powerful engine, it has the most comfortable suspension setup. Again, like the previous car, it offers class leading in-cabin space. There's a very healthy equipment list as well. So the Wagoner really offers everything in this package. And when it comes to price, that's where the Wagoner will not let you down either. Because this car is available in the top-end ZXi trim in this AMT automatic spec. Whereas the Santro is not available in the top-end spec. The Tiago is and that is by far the most expensive car at near about 6.5 lakh rupees X showroom. This car is at about 6.11 lakh rupees, but that's because it's not the top, it's the sports variant. So you don't get a rear wiper, you don't get a rear camera, and you miss out on some other equipment as well, under the top end variant rather. But when it comes to the Wagoner, you can have this car in the AMT automatic spec, even in lower end variants, the VXI mid-level trim, in which there is the one liter engine option as well. So this car is offered with two engine options, two AMT options, so you see your price band is so wide in there that it's going to fit in a whole lot more customers there as well. So bearing all of this in mind, the Wagner then comes out as the unmatched king of the B-segment hatchback. And this is something that you will witness on the sales charts as well as the Wagner simply soars past its other rivals. Now don't go anywhere because when we come back, we revisit the Katia Concourse at the Rambagh Palace in Jaipur. <laughs> Welcome back to the Auto X Show. Now last week we visited the Cartier Travel with Style Concourse and spoke to Manvinder Singh Barwani, the curator and organizer of this incredible event. This time we speak to some of the owners of these beautiful historic machines to see just what it takes to keep these beautiful pieces of history still on the road. In last week's episode, we gave you a detailed look at India's leading vintage and classic car show the Cartier Travel with Style Concours. This week, we get to speak to the proud owners and classic car collectors giving us a glimpse at the stories behind the cars and what they think of the Cartier Concours. When we think of old cars, the dream is of course to have a car that's been in the family throughout its life. But for most of us, it remains a dream. For Vijit though, that's the reality. This is a 1937 Ford V8 Woody station wagon. Vijit, what's the story behind the car? This car has been in the family since 1937. It was gifted by the King of Jaipur to my grandfather because he crashed my grandfather's car. So the car got re repaired, the one he crashed, but he still came and gift gifted this us to us. So it's been in the family since then. And the reason why it stayed with us for so long is that since the advent of this car, our house has had three cars plus in life. So it got tagged as a lucky car. So then we kept it. So that's the and, story. And I assume it's going to be a family heirloom for your future I, generations? Yeah, for sure, for sure, for sure. Do you, 
Do you still get an opportunity to drive this car every now and then? Yeah, we do drive it. Uh, it's, it's becoming more and more difficult, but yes, we do drive it sometimes. And it, it's interesting, it's in the preservation class. This is the original condition. This is how it's sort of weathered over the past 80 years. Yes. Do you intend to keep it like this? Yeah, we intend, we, intend to, we intend to keep it like this because uh, because of having a number of cars in the house. Somehow this car has not uh, done so many kilometers on the mileometer. It's barely done 25,000 kilometers. So the engine is quite new in that sense. So hopefully it should run and nowadays with the traffic conditions it's difficult riding it around. Now. So you would say you're a happy Ford family? Yeah, yeah, I'm a happy Ford family. I'm very happy. Yeah, there's one more incident. Around 20 years back, uh, Mr. Gerald Ford came to Jaipur and we, they requested us and I loaned them this car and he drove in this car from the airport to Rambal. So I gave it to them. So, so okay. a, so. You're a lucky man, Vijay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. At Katia Concourse, we are with Jyotsna and Ragini Sanghi. Uh, they have a beautiful collection of cars, the highlight of which for me personally is the Lagonda M45, only one of its kind in the country. Um, you attended most of the Cartier Concourse in yes. uh, all in six Gatine. of them actually. All six of them? Yes. What, what's your experience been? How, how have you seen it evolve? The experience has been amazing, Ishan. In fact, with attending all six of them, there is always an up, you know, an upmarket in every car that comes into every segment of every class. Now, specifically for the Chevy trucks that are there, it shows the transition of the road in, of the road transport industry. As you can see, it's nice to see how the transition happens for the country as well. And this is one of the most iconic displays of you know the growth of the industry displaying trucks yes. and of course the others are the most exquisite classes of pre and post American and the rest of them uh, of course one of its kind the M45 the history behind the car how is it been in the family do you guys still get to drive it once in a we while do. we do I've been driving her around in Bombay as well took her to took her to Pebble as well before Cartier she was in Cartier 2008 she's been a beautiful beautiful drive the most smoothest girl I've ever driven and uh, yeah she's uh, she's an M45 Rapide uh, built by the coach uh, the coach work from Abbott's uh, builders itself and uh, in fact the Maharaja of uh, Bhavnagar had picked it up from the shop floor so he fell in love with it and then it exchanged hands with another owner and then it came to us and it's, so it's, uh, it's done a 70 mile drive in Pebble and she, she just roared over there so it was, it was great. It, it was has great. some amazing features also. It has a concealed tyre at the back which you rarely see. I think the beauty of this car is more the rear of it, the aerodynamic shape of this car because it was essentially a racing vehicle. So you must see the features of the car and take, see the back of it because it's one of its kind out here. Thank, Thank you so much. You. Thank, Thank you very you. much. You, Pleasure. Have Thank a lovely you. time. With that, it's a wrap from this year's Katia Concor. Of course, with so much automotive history yet to be discovered in India, we look forward to the next event. Now the 2019 World Car Award finalists have recently been announced and for the first time, two of the three are full EVs. The top three for the World Car of the Year 2019 are the Audi e-tron, the Jaguar I-Pace, both of which I've driven and both of which are fantastic full EVs. The Volvo S60 and V60. For the world urban car, the top three are the Hyundai Santro, which is great for India since the car was designed specifically for our market. The Kia Soul and the Suzuki Jimny, which we absolutely love and would love to see in India. For world luxury car, it's the Audi A7, the Audi Q8, and the BMW 8 Series. For World Performance Car, it's the Aston Martin Vantage, the McLaren 720S, and the Mercedes-Benz AMG 4-door Coupe. World Green Car is the Audi e-tron and the Jaguar I-Pace once again, as well as the Hyundai Nexo. World Car Design of the Year is the Jaguar I-Pace, Suzuki Jimny, and Volvo XC40. Stay tuned for the winners, which will be announced at the New York International Auto Show on the 17th of April, 2019. Now don't go anywhere, because when we come back, Ishan drives the brand new BMW X4 SUV Coupe. Welcome back to the Auto X Show. Now BMW has always redefined the rules with its SUVs. The X5, when it was first introduced, demonstrated that SUVs needn't be big and lumbering. With the X6, they introduced the first Coupe SUV. And now, here's the X4.
The original idea for an SUV was very simple. It was a vehicle that was built for utility, for use, to be a workhorse. It was something that had a decent engine, high ground clearance, maybe four-wheel drive, and you could take it virtually anywhere. You could store a lot of luggage. Of course, in the past 20 years, that definition has completely changed. SUVs are the hottest thing on the market today. We know that. And this is a rather extreme expression of what an SUV could be. It's the X4. It's available in three engine options, and we are driving it today to find out what it actually offers to customers. The X4 is perhaps a rather extreme interpretation of what an SUV should look like. Like I said earlier, they were supposed to be utility vehicles, they were supposed to be practical. This, mm, I don't think it's any of that. This is a style statement. This is a car that has brand history. You know, the first generation X6 was the first sort of amalgamation of a coupe and an SUV. You can see by the sloping roofline, this is supposed to be a sporty coupe and an SUV at the same time. Um, it does catch your eye, I don't like it, but the fact of the matter is that this design language, I didn't think much of the X6 when it was first launched, but it was a huge success worldwide. People wanted to make this style statement. In that sense of the word, the X4 works. It's got the huge double kidney grille in the front. Um, but what's interesting is with the huge wheel arches and the relative design of the car, even on 19-inch wheels, it looks under-tired. It, look, it, it, it looks like it needs at least 20-inch or 21-inch wheels, which are slightly impractical in India. Also impractical is the fact that because of that sloping roofline, you have very limited headroom in the rear. Uh, but in actual sense of the word, it's a car that you can't ignore. It's a car that catches your eye. It's a car that makes a style statement. It's a car that makes you stand out. For good or for bad, that's for you to decide. But yeah, it's, it's a car that stands out in your face and people love it for it. Now, I might not be a fan of the BMW X4 design. I think it's a little vain, I think it's a little uh, too complicated. But there are some uh, aspects of the car which are seriously likeable. Um, what I love first and foremost are the full black interiors. You know, they're a rarity in India. Everybody wants beige. And I hate beige. And this black interiors, red detailing, great seats, fantastic side support. It's, it's absolutely gorgeous. I, I love the fact of how the car's finished. Uh, there are, there's actually real metal here in the switches. Uh, the way the car functions, um, the, the soft touch responses, the, the, I mean, you know, just the interfaces. And especially, I think, the, one of the highlights of the car has to be, rather, one of the highlights of the BMW range has to be the iDrive system. The iDrive multimedia system is just, uh, over the past almost 20 years now, roughly, they've just evolved it to a level where it becomes very intuitive. You've got gesture responses, so I can turn up the uh, volume of the stereo turn down the volume of the stereo just by gestures it's just so intuitive and so well done that makes you think that maybe that's a trick that a lot of other car makers are missing out on that's one second is this the powertrain of the car is absolutely sublime um, the x4 in india is offered in three versions two liter diesel 3 litre inline 6 diesel and what we are driving is the 30i, the 2 litre petrol turbocharged 255 odd horsepower. Uh, but it's just the combination of the car, the engine and the gearbox, which is fantastic. I mean, it's a small engine, it's turbocharged, has a pretty high output, but there's virtually no turbo lag. There's not even a semblance of turbo lag. So whenever you want it, there's immediate power delivery. Helping that is the absolutely stunning 8-speed ZF gearbox that BMW uses. I mean, I, like I was telling the editor through yesterday, that it's just the response of the gearbox, the downshift, the upshift, the shift. It's so seamless that for once, this is one of the cars that I don't miss having a manual option in. It absolutely drives brilliant. But at the same time, there are problems and there are compromises with the X4. Like I said earlier, because of the design, because of the transmission tunnel, this is a strict four-seater and if you're a tall person sitting at the back, well, that's a different challenge altogether. 
bigger problem for me is despite uh, being on 19 inch wheels, uh, despite having a pretty high sidewall, 50 section sidewall, it's really stiff and that's been a hallmark of all oddball SUVs that BMW's produced. Both the X6's, earlier generation, current generation, this generation X4, the ride is really, really stiff and on smooth roads, the X4 is absolutely planted, drives very well, is very smooth to take care of. But on bad roads, it's just absolutely back-breaking. And for me, that is a deal breaker. At 60 plus lakhs, X showroom for any of the versions of the X4. Uh, the problem with the car is that you have to be really focused on what it offers as a design concept, as a statement, or rather as a style statement. Because if you're going to spend that kind of money, actually you're going to spend more money than what an X3 is sold for or a Volvo XC60 or an Audi Q5 is sold for, is that you get lesser headroom, you get lesser practicality, you get a very stiff ride. Of course, you do get a very, very good engine powertrain package, probably the best in class package. Um, you get some lovely interiors, interiors that I love, but it's a difficult compromise to sort of justify. So. Unless you've got a very strong design streak, unless you've got to make a really strong design statement, I would think I would prefer an X3 or a Volvo XC60 or an RDQ5 over the X4 because the X4 otherwise is it's, it's great in small parts of the car, but as a whole, I'm not really a big fan. Well, that's all the time we have for you today. Thank you for joining us. Remember to follow us on social media for your daily dose of all things automotive. And remember, it's chaos out there. So always buckle up and wear your helmets. We'll see you again next weekend on the AutoX Show.